I own a small cabin that I often visit on the weekends. I live and work in the city now, but I grew up in a rural area, and I still prefer the peaceful quietness of small towns. One Saturday, I packed up some provisions and tools, then left to the cabin early morning. There were some repairs I had to make to the roof of the cabin. Believe it or not, I find working with my hands both relaxing and therapeutic. I find that it keeps me sharp, and the end result brings me satisfaction. I wouldn't spend my weekend any other way. I park my car on the outskirts of the forest, since the rest of the way to the cabin, one has to travel on foot. It's no big deal. We're talking about 10 minutes of walk through a picturesque forest. It's actually one of the reasons why I bought the old cabin. It keeps me slightly more isolated from the roads and people in general. Five minutes into the walk, I came across a bear cub that had been killed by something. I say something because I didn't see any wounds on it. There were no bite marks, no scratch wounds. I mean, the cub could have gotten up at any moment, and I wouldn't have been surprised. By first look, it was a total mystery how it had been killed. I knelt right next to the cub and began inspecting its body. Upon inspection, a couple of questions had been answered, but one new question had popped up. What I got from the inspection was that it was a recent kill, and that its spine had been shattered. What I didn't understand is what could have done such damage. The first thing that comes to mind is another bear. But if that were the case, the cub's fur and skin should have been ripped off in massive chunks. An adult bear can do some incredible damage with their front paws alone. That is to say, with their giant claws, they always leave their mark. The cub's carcass left me a bit apprehensive, but I had things to do and it was time to leave. I moved the carcass away from the trail and continued walking towards my cabin. Upon arriving at the cabin, I came across another carnage. This time, I saw the carcasses of another cub and that of an adult female bear. The adult female bear is probably the mother of both the cubs found by the trail and the one by the cabin. That answered who the mama bear was, but it left me with even more questions. Just what creature did this to the three bears? All three bears had their spines snapped off like twigs, and none of them had any scratch or bite wounds. Bears do eat other bears more often than you think. They are, after all, opportunistic animals. That said, it's mostly adult bears eating cubs, and it's not a rare occurrence. So, as you can see, there are many questions to be asked in this instance. We have three bears that have been killed under mysterious circumstances. None of them have been eaten, and all of them without superficial wounds. There's no figuring this out. I don't know any animal that can kill an adult bear so cleanly. I mean, how big and strong does it have to be to hold the bear still, then snap its neck like it was twisting a bottle cap? Again, as far as I'm concerned, there's no animal of such power and size. That day, I left the cabin not long after discovering the dead bears. If there was something out there that could kill an adult bear, then me as a human was akin to a seal next to a great white shark. There was no way that I was sticking around. I sold the cabin to a local businessman a couple of months thereafter. I told him why I was selling it and warned him about it too, but he didn't seem all too concerned about it. He told me in passing that city folks get scared of leaves falling. I don't think he believed me even after seeing the now decomposed carcasses. I'm still yet to figure out what creature could have killed those three bears. If I were to speak openly, I would say that it was the doing of a creature that we don't know of yet. Something that's been forgotten in time, but is still out there and still killing. This was in 2002 and I was in my early 40s. Six months prior, I had a divorce and it had taken four months to reach the settlement. So basically, it was around the time when I was finally free to do whatever I wanted. My ex and I didn't have kids and I retired in my late 30s. 
At the time, I could literally do whatever I wanted. The first thing I did was to purchase a new place of residence. I wanted to live somewhere safe and quiet, but it had to be close to the city. After much research and consideration, I decided I was moving into a gated community. I gotta say, the neighborhood was really nice. All 85 houses in town were in immaculate conditions, and the community features were so well looked after. It also came with many amenities such as swimming pools, tennis courts, a bowling alley, golf courses, a gym, to list a few. So on the surface level, it looked like the perfect place to live. I didn't get to meet anyone on the first day of the move. I saw some people walking and driving by, but didn't really get a chance to say hi to anyone. The next day, however, I began knocking on my neighbor's doors to say hi and to introduce myself. The family across the street were, how do I put this gently? Well, they were weirdos. When I knocked on their door, the husband came out and I put on a big smile for the douchebag. And what a douchebag he was, he refused to shake my hand and responded to every word I spoke with okay. And that was it. That was the full interaction. The second house I visited wasn't much different. I didn't see a single smile and the guy reluctantly shook my hand. By the way, he too only knew how to use two words. Yes and okay. Listen, I'm not saying that people must return a smile with a smile, but isn't it common decency to greet new neighbors nicely? I mean, that's what I do. I knocked on three houses on that day and decided that I was done with the meet and greet for the day. If you're curious, there was no one in the third house. As the days passed, I noticed a series of odd things about the neighborhood. Firstly, there were no children within the gated community. There was one family with two teenage daughters. They are the Henderson family. Those two Henderson girls were the only people in town under the age of 30 as far as I was concerned. Everyone else looked to be in their late 30s to early 50s. And by the way, the Hendersons were the only normal people in town as far as my investigation was concerned up to that point. Talking to anyone else outside of the family was akin to attempting conversations with pebbles and rocks. Secondly, there were many more empty houses than I had expected. I walked around the neighborhood several times and my last count was 21 empty homes. I had a conversation about that with Mr. Henderson. He told me that when their family had moved here, that there were three other normal families within town. But they had since moved out and the Hendersons were planning to do the same pretty soon. Like me, they moved here because of the relative safety and privacy, but they had no idea what the people were like. About a month after moving there, for the first time aside from the Hendersons, I had a neighbor knock on my door. The individual was Mr. Bailey from two houses down. He gave me the creeps as soon as I opened the door. He had this unnatural smile on his face and invited me to join him and others in what he called neighborhood assembly. I told him I would be there and was about to shut the door, but Mr. Bailey continued to stand there with that fake smile on his face. He only left when I insisted that I had a chore to finish before joining him. That interaction was extremely creepy. I didn't know what type of meeting they were having and thus I dressed up in semi-formal attire and left the house. Mr. Bailey said they were meeting up in the bowling alley. That's about 5 minutes of walk and so I walked there. The meeting was already in progress by the time I got there. I managed to get inside the building without anyone noticing and thank God for that because I knew right away I did not want to be there. Observing them interact with one another was like watching half-baked robots trying to have normal human conversation. I didn't stay for too long, but the conversation were about what they had done in the past months, the things they found joyful, and what more they wanted to do. Something along that line. In any event, I sneaked out of the bowling alley and went straight home after that. I should also mention that the Henderson were not in attendance. 
I had a talk with Mr. Henderson a couple of days thereafter. He too was invited in the past and still gets invited every month, but he never attended a single meeting since he found everyone in the neighborhood really creepy. The Hendersons moved out after a month. I did the same about two months thereafter when I finally managed to sell the house. I took a loss on the house, but I was more than happy to make the sacrifice. I was so ready to move on. I actually moved into another gated community after that. The second time, however, I did my due diligence to observe the people in the neighborhood as much as I checked the property itself. I'm glad to say that I still live in the same neighborhood and I've been loving it here from day one. As for the other gated community, they basically closed their doors to newcomers around 2010. The entire neighborhood was bought up by some people, I'm assuming the residents, and they had since turned it into a type of communal living facility. The community went from weird to completely nuts in less than a decade. I don't know much more about them and that's probably a good thing. It's hard to say what the deal was with that town and these people, but people like them actually exist in this world and if you think about it, that's kind of scary. <laughs>